Hello once again ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the final lecture on the topic of brittle deformation and faulting for the geodynamics course. In this lecture we're going to talk about predicting fault orientation. So we're going to tie together what we've learned about friction and plasticity and then talk about how that can be applied to predict the orientation of faults in the earth. And we'll do this by first introducing Anderson's theory and then talk about how that theory can be applied. The Anderson theory is basically a version of the Moore Coulomb criterion in which the, um, the principal stresses are used just like we had before, but combined with assuming a lithostatic pressure. In our case, we'd say sigma yy is equal to rho gy. We've seen this a number of times now. Now, if we have a reverse fault, then, or uh, this is a thrust or reverse fault, sigma yy is going to be the minimum principal stress. For a normal fault, sigma yy is going to be the maximum principal stress, and then it should be equal to the intermediate or sigma 2 uh, for the case of a strike slip fault. And so those are all just illustrated here where you can easily see the orientations of sigma 1 being vertical for a normal fault um, and sigma 3 being horizontal. In that case, you're basically pulling apart. In fact, your sigma 3 could even be um, you know, in the opposite orientation of how it's shown here if you want to think about it that way. In the case of a normal fault, of course, when you're squeezing things together, the largest principal stress is going to be horizontal and perpendicular to the fault, and then for strike slip, they'll take on the orientation as shown here. Now, in terms of differential stress, um, we've not really talked about differential stress in a while, but I'll just remind you, differential stress is just the difference between sigma 1 and sigma 3. We can state Anderson's theory basically like this with a whole bunch of things that we've already seen here. So for a reverse or uh, thrust fault, we can see that the differential stress is going to be equal to 2 times the cohesion plus the frictional strength times sigma yy, that's going to be the normal stress, minus rho wgy. So this is the pore fluid pressure component divided by the square root of the frictional coefficient squared plus 1 minus the frictional coefficient. For normal faults, you'll have a very similar looking relationship with some negative signs in here uh, in different places. So you'll have a minus 2 up here and a minus fs. Same thing on the bottom here, except you've got this plus fs instead of minus fs, uh, as you had for the case of a reverse fault. And then the relationship for strike slip is, um, again, it's a bit like what we see above, uh, at least the top part is like that for a reverse, reverse fault, and then here in the bottom we have the still square root of fs squared plus 1, but no minus fs. Now what this means in terms of the plot that we're looking at here is we can look at the lithostatic stress, so that's sigma l, versus the differential stress sigma d. And you can see these relationships that basically as you go deeper in the earth it requires much lower differential stresses to have rocks fail under extension than it does for compression. So if you go to the depth equivalent of 100 megapascals with the static stress, you could see extension would occur at below 100 megapascals differential stress, whereas you have to go way out here to about maybe 400 megapascals differential stress for rock failure under compression. So that gives us a nice way of looking at the relationships between um, the different types of rock failure and the conditions under which they would be expected to occur. And it goes along with this kind of intuitive idea that when you pull a rock apart, it's much easier to fracture it than when you try to do the same thing by squeezing the rock. So now let's look at how we can apply this Anderson's theory to predict dip angles of normal and reverse faults. In this case, we'll call the dip angle uh, the Greek letter beta. We'll make a couple simple assumptions here. We're going to assume that the sigma yy, the vertical uh, normal stress is simply rho gy, just like we've done previously. It's the lithostatic stress. And sigma xx is going to be rho gy plus delta sigma xx, where delta sigma xx is some tectonic deviatoric stress. So it would be positive when we're squeezing the rock in the case of a reverse fault and negative in the case where we're pulling the rock apart um, for a normal fault. 
So here's our picture. We have the fault surface running like this. We're just looking at kind of a cross-sectional view through some layer of the earth that's being faulted. And um, you can see, you know, the, the hanging wall here and the foot wall there. In order to deal with this, we first need to relate sigma xx and sigma yy to normal and shear stresses in order to use these Amitan's laws that we've looked at earlier on, uh, maybe two or three uh, video lectures back. So we've got to, um, in order to do that, we basically have to go back all the way to lecture set three to this rotation of a coordinate system idea that we had dealt with um, when we talked about the principal stresses. And so we can take our principal stresses in the, um, or our normal stresses rather, in the X and Y coordinate system and rotate them by some angle theta to get the normal and shear stresses um, using the equations here. And so you can see uh, for the normal stress, for instance, that we just got one half the sum of sigma xx plus sigma yy plus one half the difference of those two times the cosine of two theta. And for sigma s, it's simply minus one half times the difference between sigma xx and sigma yy times the sine of two theta. Where here, theta, just to note, is uh, with respect to vertical and so um, theta is then going to be equal to 90 degrees or pi over 2 minus the dip angle of the fault beta. Now if we plug in our values for sigma xx and sigma yy, um, then we come up with something that looks like this for our normal and shear stresses. And all that is is just substituting in our assumed values um, for the uh, Anderson's or Amitan's law, sorry. Um, and if we were to do the same thing here, we've basically assumed there's no pore fluid pressure, but if we did the same thing with assuming pore fluid pressure, then we end up with something that looks like this, where our shear stress over here on the left side is our tau. That's the same thing as you have here. So plus or minus delta sigma xx over two times the sine of two theta, that's the shear stress, is equal to fs times the normal stress minus the um, hydrostatic pressure. And so there then is the coefficient of friction. Here's the normal stress, rho gy, minus um, the hydrostatic pressure, Pw. And then there's the rest of the normal stress piece in there. So right, our normal stress was rho gy plus this stuff. Then we have rho gy minus Pw plus this piece here. So then we have shear stress, coefficient of friction, and our normal stress, and in this case, we've also then subtracted off the uh, fluid pressure. And again, here, it's important to note that in this plus or minus relationship, the upper symbol would be for reverse faults, the lower symbol would be for normal faults. If we rearrange that previous expression, we can basically solve for delta sigma xx, and you end up with something that looks like this. Um, there's not really any need to walk through this equation. It's simply just rearranging the terms to solve for delta sigma xx, at which point we can make an assumption, and that is that faulting is going to occur when the tectonic stress is minimized. And so the absolute magnitude then of this term should be minimized in order to calculate the conditions under which we expect um, faulting to occur. And you can do that by taking the derivative of this relationship here with respect to theta. If you take the derivative of this and set it equal to zero, that is a way to find the minimum value. You can think about it like this, that in some of the plots we've seen, for instance, for the Reynolds number, we had these kind of U-shaped plots. And when you take the derivative of this plot and set it equal to zero, that's basically taking the value where the slope is equal to zero in one of those plots. And if it's a U-shaped thing, that means the slope is going to be zero down at the bottom of the U. And so that's the idea is that we take this derivative with respect to theta and set it equal to zero. And then you come out with the simple relationships that the tangent of two theta is equal to minus over plus one over the friction, uh, coefficient of friction, or tangent of two beta is equal to plus or minus one over the coefficient of friction. And again, upper symbols for reverse faults, lower is for normal faults.
So with that, we can then combine our two equations from the previous slide and make plots like these here using this relatively simple um, equation of the um, differential tectonic stress. So for instance, we can see here that the dip angle we predict for normal faults and thrust faults versus the coefficient of friction Fs. You can see that both of them start at 45 degree angle as the predicted orientation, but the thrust faults tend to be predicted to be shallower. And if we go to about 0.85 on here for our typical rock types, that would give us something like a 30 degree dip angle for a thrust fault. If we went straight up from there to um, normal fault case, we'd get something like 60 degrees for our predicted orientation of a normal fault. We can also see here that the, um, the differential stress, the differential tectonic stress, if it's compared to the coefficient of friction, you can see that for a thrust fault, it gets very large. It gets much larger than the difference for the case of a normal fault where the differential stresses are relatively small. And um, so these are some useful ideas for being able to predict the orientation and, uh, and the stresses that would be acting on different types of faults. So that's it for brittle deformation and faulting. It's time to take the final quiz and we'll see you for the next video lecture set on um, viscous deformation.